Hello, everybody. We're just going to wait for a little bit. I'm just letting a few more people in. I'm, I'm sure people will be joining as we go on, but I'll just keep clicking. Give me two seconds. Bonnie, I, I see your screen and it's like, I can see, I was like, why do I see myself? But I think it's like you're doing a screen share. I don't know if that, if that's true or not, but just in case you don't want to share your screen, it's on there. <laughs> I think we're supposed to have about 45 people. So we might just wait like two or three minutes to uh, until everybody joins or for the majority. Everyone's just kind of coming in now. Mary Liz, your background is quite interesting. How did you get it? Like, <laughs> that's very, very appropriate. I love this look, like where you can see the skater going across. <laughs> it's beautiful. I'm just taking a look. Is that triple axle? Looks like triple axle or double axle. Double? I can't count the rotations. I don't remember if I was doing double time or triple. That was a joke. It's obviously <laughs> no, I was actually thinking like I thought maybe you were taking the screenshot of somebody. <laughs> okay. Well, this is so exciting. We have like 45 people registered for this, which is awesome. And uh, thank you, Mary Liz, for you know promoting it through the Quebec section too. That was great. I see a lot of. French names, meaning that must be coming from the Quebec section. <laughs> so maybe we'll wait like five, like till 5.05 and then we can get started, whoever joins in later, because we are also running it on uh, Facebook Live, so it's available for everybody else to see it later on as well. But we'll just hang in there for a little bit. Angela, are you able to accept people into the room from your side if I start and I'm kind of occupied? It's just, it's mm -hmm. going to be a little bit difficult no. for me to... Okay. Um, not really, let me check. Okay. I will try to multitask. I'm going to be a little crazy when 
we're only at uh, 19 people, so it'll be like back and forth clicking people to let in. So in the meantime, for those of you who are here, if you uh, have your chat available, if you want to just put in like where you're from, that would be great. You can see who's here from all around. Oh, we've got some skaters too. Hi, Simon. <laughs> oh, Mexico. Cool. Nice. Got Ottawa, Peterborough, neat, Montreal, <laughs> Quebec. Awesome. So we'll just wait, New Market. Hey. So we'll wait one more minute and then we'll get started and whoever else wants to join in can, uh, we'll let them in later. And then we'll spend, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a quick kind of agenda of today's conversation, just so it's a little bit more organized. And then we will go piece by piece and try to identify common uh, things that happen with online training. And uh, I think this uh, kind of segues into my introduction. So maybe we'll get started now and then we can go from there. If you have any questions or anything, you can uh, just ask me in the chat or if it's uh, something urgent, you want to jump in, um, just do one of those. There's a thing on Zoom where you can kind of raise your hand and then when I finish the sentence, maybe we can uh, get to that question, okay? Okay, so welcome everybody so far. And for those of you joining us later on, you will probably be able to hear this later. Uh, my name is Signe Ronka and I'm uh, the founder of FlexiFit program. It's a sports specific conditioning program for figure skaters. And um, just a little background about myself, you, if you don't know me necessarily, you, um, I was a former international and national level skater for Canada a long time ago in the junior ranks. And uh, I had to end my skating career due to injuries. I was getting quite high up there. I competed at Junior Worlds and uh, Junior Grand Prix Finals and all of those internationals leading up to senior level. And uh, my career got cut short because I had multiple different types of injuries like tendinitis. And we'll, we'll talk about some of these actually later on and how that comes from overtraining. And, uh, and things that could be prevented with training, not just for online, but also with just general training that you do for office. And so um, after I finished skating, I got into coaching and I accomplished my level three. So national competitive coach in Canada. And then I also got into the strength and conditioning side. So I studied my, uh, through the National Strength and Conditioning Association, and I certified as a strength and conditioning specialist uh, through that association. And now I have this program based on both what my experience is with off ice and with on ice and put them together to form a uh, kind of all well-rounded training program built in for skaters to train properly and prevent injuries. So today's topic is really key to my heart because it's one of those things that um, I actually stopped skating for was due to injuries. So I wanted to present this to coaches, but also anybody who really wants to listen to it because it's related to skaters and parents as well if they're interested in the topic of online training and how to prevent injuries from their side of things as well. So uh, a little overview of what we're gonna do today and what we'll talk about is uh, first off, like what kind of injuries can happen with online training. And uh, we'll, we'll go through step by step uh, what from a skater's perspective and from a coach's perspective. And then um, we're going to talk about in more depth 
how coaches can help prevent injuries for skaters because at the end of the day it's the responsibility of the adult to help see where things are, are are going wrong or can be prevented so we're going to talk about easy screening and then complex screening so some of the complex will be related to more of a strength and conditioning perspective so if you don't have a background in it it might be an interesting kind of topic for you to listen in on so you can see and identify oh my skater might be actually overtraining or um, they might have this kind of injury coming on how can we prevent that injury from continuing on further so let's begin with uh, what kind of injuries can happen with online training. And so I, what I did was I tried to categorize these injuries into different uh, areas. So one would be a very typical injury that happens accidentally. So things that you can't control would be, you know, somebody jumping and kind of twisting their ankle and they've never done a weird jump on the floor, but it just kind of fluke and it happened. This kind of stuff can be also seen on the ice too, right? You're skating, they fall, they hit the boards and they injure their hip and they're out for like two weeks or something. So um, these are kind of what we call accidental injuries where it's like nothing you did that day particularly that led to an injury, but it just kind of happened on, on its own. Uh, then we have uh, overuse injuries. So overuse injuries can be over time. So these can be stress related. Uh, repetitive uh, injuries that happen that without even really knowing. So one day you might show up and think my knee hurts or my hip is starting to hurt, but where did that injury come from? Was it something you did on that day? Did you fall specifically on that uh, joint or on that area and injure it? Or was it something that's over time developed into something called an overuse injury? And then we have uh, also technique related injuries and these can be sometimes overuse as well in that same category but um, more so when a skater is doing something incorrectly for a long period of time and then that is based on something that's related to technique so if the for example you're doing a squat jump and the skater keeps putting repetitive stress into the knee and into the quads what happens is over time you can develop tendonitis or some knee pain that's related to that as well. So what we need to do is be able to identify these certain things. And I will talk a little bit more in depth about this uh, later on to the complex uh, things that coaches can look at. So those are the type of injuries that can happen with online training, but this maybe is also a conversation, not just for online training, but in general training that you're doing with your skaters, whether it's online, whether it's in person, uh, I think it can be related, but I think with this whole, you know, pandemic going on and a lot of people coaching their skaters online now, uh, I think it's important to discuss what kind of things can happen and from both sides, from a skater's perspective and coach's perspective. And if you have any questions later related to what you're doing from uh, training and in, in the sense of your own kind of group and what you're seeing, uh, please message in the chat group and we can take a look at that when we get to the questions and answers. I'm going to leave probably 15 minutes at the end so we can discuss anything that you want to talk about regarding your own training for your skaters. So let's start with the skaters perspective because I think that one is probably a little bit quicker than the coaches one and we can cover it uh, pretty fast. So in terms of skaters, and I think this relates to also coaches being involved with watching their skaters and making sure that they're actually having the proper um, equipment and uh, flooring and all of that. So let's talk about equipment. And what I mean by equipment, a couple things. So first of all, equipment can mean what you're wearing. So are you wearing the proper running shoes? Uh, sometimes I see skaters, um, just from my own experience with training, wear, uh, in bare feet, which it really is okay for certain exercises, but then when it comes to off-ice jumping, I always get a little bit anxious watching when skaters are jumping in bare feet. Um, to a certain extent, like simple jump little exercises are okay, but when it comes to more rotation, it's a little bit more important that you have the proper, uh, you know, footwear to go along with the jumps. It's like if you were in skating and you're doing your triple LUTs with really broken down skates, what would happen to your feet eventually? So. Uh, it's just that excessive pounding that you put in the force that matters what kind of shoes you're wearing. So 
I would highly suggest that all of your skaters, if you're doing your off-ice training, and even if they say, you know, it's more comfortable wearing fair feet, just make sure they actually wear the shoes for more rotational uh, exercises. And then in terms of uh, equipment, other than what you're wearing, uh, I know that a lot of times we struggle as, you know, even as trainers to do online training sometimes because there is uh, a very difficult way of teaching once we, do, we don't have our own space to have equipment to give the skaters to try and use. So we end up doing kind of things that they have in the house and picking up items or whatever is available to use. And it becomes sometimes in a personal training setting, it's okay because you can monitor the weight appropriate to the skater. But sometimes in a group setting, if a skater, if you're suggesting, okay, everybody grab a medicine ball or something that you have, and they just take whatever and you don't notice what they're holding, it might not be an appropriate weight for that skater to use. And it ends up being just like, okay, whatever, that's fine. Just use whatever you have because it's easier. Whereas we need to make sure we're asking, you know, why are we giving the skater this loan to use? Is it appropriate for their level, for their size, for what they're working on? And then if it is, then go ahead, use it. If it's not, maybe it's better just not to use anything at all and work on the technique to go through and make sure that the exercise is done properly. So equipment to me is, is huge because even myself when I'm uh, training uh, the skaters, you know, it's easy to just be like, okay, well, if you don't have this, you know, just use this instead. But at the end of the day, for example, even with resistance bands, if it's not heavy enough, for example, in the opposite direction, um, then I always come up with a new exercise that might be more beneficial rather than just doing the exercise for the sake of it. Um, I come up with something different so that it's, it's still challenging. So you don't want to under challenge the skater either just because they only have like a lightweight resistance band, right? So there's ways you can kind of come up with a different exercise to target the same muscle group, but in a different way so that they actually get challenged through that and not just going through the movements. Um, so second thing, I guess, uh, in relation to skaters would be proper flooring. So flooring is really, really key. And of course, we don't all have the opportunity to jump on beautiful hardwood floors that are meant for, uh, you know, studio surfaces that have padding underneath them and, and are appropriate for jumps and all the stuff that we do. And we still have to manage training regardless. So there is proper ways to do it. Um, even if it is, you know, training on, you know, concrete or whatever. Uh, when it comes to training on concrete, I would, uh, because I've seen a lot of skaters outside working out, um, there's nothing wrong with necessarily doing it once in a while. If you're doing some jumps or something, you know, one day a week kind of thing. But if you're training every single day with your coach and you're on your online training and, and you're on concrete every day doing repetitive pounding, that's when it can get a little bit more stressful on the joints and a little bit more stressful on the bones and and the the amount of force you constantly put down into that um into the floor is going to reflect over time on how your joints can handle that pressure especially if when we get into the conversation on overtraining it's going to show that if you're doing repetitive stress exercises and adding concrete and adding no shoes, that is a higher risk for injury. It's not necessarily that you will get injured training on concrete, but you're putting yourself at a higher risk, which is, do you really want to put yourself there? Or is there a smarter way? Maybe one day you don't do uh, jumps on concrete. Maybe one day you have your mats laid out or you find some rubberized flooring that you can put out um, they have all sorts of stuff that you can buy that, you know, just you put on top of it, even in, in ice rinks, if you don't have a proper room to train in and you're training on that upper level, for example, you can put the, the padding down so that it's a little bit more uh, cushioning for the skaters when they're landing their jumps. Uh, if you're just doing core exercises, a thin mat will do and it's not really a big deal. So flooring is key. Um, another big thing I've noticed over my training days is skaters training in the grass. Um, <laughs> I love the grass. It's a very fun place to uh, train outside, but 
when you're doing your jump exercises, especially when it's more rotation, excuse me, more rotation, you have to be really careful because the grass is uneven. And when you jump on uneven turf, it becomes a little bit more dangerous as you go through the jumping for a twisted ankle, or if you jump off center on one of the jumps on the takeoff, you can go sideways and fall on your hip. So these kind of things can happen with grass training. Uh, turf training is not so bad. It's a, a little bit better. So if you have turf uh, kind of in your backyard, I don't know, some people do, it's actually not too bad. Just be careful. It's a little more slippery. So when you're doing, if you're doing any sprint exercises or agility, just um, that's when you need to be a little bit more aware. So just doing your research and making sure the skaters in your class are, are on, on proper ground, that's a very important part. And then another big part from the skater's perspective is communication. So I know we deal with a lot of younger skaters a lot and uh, communication skills are not fully developed always at the younger age, um, but what we need to do to help develop those skills is ask questions as coaches. So uh, communication on specifically on fatigue. So sometimes we like to push the skaters through fatigue because we think it's going to be beneficial for them. And sometimes it's good because maybe they're just not pushing themselves hard enough. And we all know those type of skaters, but, um, but sometimes they actually are really tired and maybe it's not a good time to be pushing them through that fatigue because of all of the other components we're going to talk about later when we get into the complex uh, components for coaches. So communication is key um, from both sides. The skater has to communicate when they feel tired, if they have an injury, if they feel like there's some pain starting in some form or another. These are all key things that the skater is responsible to communicate with the coach because from the coach's perspective, we can't read their minds, right? So we need that information to come back to us. So now uh, let's get into the coach's uh, perspective on uh, how to prevent injuries on training and what we can do to help that kind of with our online training. So I, I kind of broke this down into easy versus complex. So for the easy ones, we're gonna talk about it pretty quickly and then I'm gonna spend more time for the complex because I think that's where it'll be more interesting information and I think most of you will be uh, more appreciative of that kind of information. So the easy ones that we'll just cover just to make sure we cover all the grounds, um, screen numbers. So the first thing is making sure you can see everybody on the screen. So it's very important when you do online training that you're not flipping through multiple pages. And I guess it depends on your computer of how many people fit in one screen, but maybe that's something you can test out and you probably tested it out for the last little while just to see, but um, the, the screen number is very important. The reason is you can't see always when, if you have to click through, if somebody is doing an exercise incorrectly. So the, the eyes on the skaters is really important. Uh, when I do my, my classes, I make sure that I have at least, you know, maximum. Uh, for myself, I just keep it limited to 15, but in our, some of our other classes, we have about 20 skaters. And you can see everybody on one side of the screen so that it makes sure you can um, identify any errors right away. So it's not, they're repeating them over and over incorrectly. Um, and then another big one is that the skaters have their videos on. I know it sounds funny, but sometimes they disappear for 10, 15 minutes. And then what do you do? Are you like <laughs> seeing what they're doing or what's happening? Um, that part to me is very important in terms of making sure, you know, if your Wi-Fi connection is not working for some reason, maybe just disconnect yourself quickly and then try to connect again. So the coach knows you're trying to get back in versus just keeping it off for 30 minutes and not and just following along it might be a little bit more safe for the skater to actually be visible to the coach and then uh, again the floor and the surface for example when we're looking at and this will kind of go hand in hand with what we're talking about in terms of the complex area but um, when we look at the flooring and the surface we have to ask ourselves okay is it more important to do the jump a million times over and over 
or should we, you know, if there's some kids training on concrete, maybe identify those skaters and say, for you, you're going to do maybe five repetitions of the actual jump and 10 repetitions of a walkthrough to go through it more carefully so that you're not excessively pounding on concrete. And then that way it's less impact and you know exactly what your skater is doing and there's not uh, a concern that they're going to injure themselves more like somebody who's jumping on a softer surface and they're doing 25 to 30 repetitions of a double axle. So those are kind of easy things to screen for. So then uh, we get into the fun stuff, the complex. So what we're going to talk about first in terms of the complex training uh, or complex things that you should look at when you're online training is first let's ask the question of what is overtraining. So a lot now with the online stuff that we've been doing, it's it's been to the point where you know some coaches are are training every single day, or maybe you're not training every single day your skaters, but they train with you and then they train with someone else, and then you know how there's all these other options now for online training. So skaters like to try a little of this and a little bit of this. And then at the end of the day, it's like, do we know what they have done throughout all of the week? Maybe not, right? So that's where it becomes really important to have that communication with the skater and parent to say, okay, it's great that you're doing other things, but we need to know what you're doing and how many hours of that are you doing? And so that becomes a key conversation between coach and skater and whoever else is working with them. So um, overtraining in simple words basically is a quick increase in intensity, duration, frequency of training with little or no rest between to recover the muscles. And it's a simple definition, but it can really involve a lot of different things. And when we take a look at what that involvement is, um, what you can say to yourself is, you know, what are the common symptoms or uh, things that you might see when a skater is overtraining so that you can identify it quickly and it doesn't get into a, an injury over time. So one of the most common things, obviously, with overtraining is fatigue and a decrease in strength. And this kind of stuff initially might be hard to see if you're not an experienced like strength and conditioning specialist where you work with these kind of athletes off ice all the time. But one thing that I would say that you really can start seeing is their, their face starts to look a little bit different. They're not as um, energetic on a regular basis. And it's not to say that one day a skater might feel more tired than another day. That's normal. But when you start seeing it over time, that's when you start kind of questioning, is this something that is happening because they're just tired all the time? But how can they be tired all the time if they're conditioned and you, you know that they've been doing all of these exercises? So why are they all of a sudden being weaker or why do they look weaker? So you'll see a decline in performance and that's a, a big, um, big thing. Zihan, do you have a question? Oh, you're just hanging out with your arm up. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you'll see a big decrease in, in, uh, in performance. And sometimes uh, you'll, you'll see the skater saying, you know, I, I can't sleep at night. I'm having a difficulty sleeping. They might not be eating correctly. Uh, all of these little things that might happen in, you know, the skater over time, even little things like coordination all of a sudden they start feeling less coordinated and you know that they can do these things in their sleep and all of a sudden they're just you know tripping or you know popping a jump more or something like that another big way to tell and this might be a little advanced for um someone who doesn't do this kind of testing all the time but uh heart rate testing so when the skater is um at a regular at an 80 to 90% heart rate max um, working through an exercise and all of a sudden they're doing the same training and they get to a 60 or 70% heart rate max and they're totally exhausted, then you know that that might be a sign of overtraining. And if you have a question, I won't go into that too much because that's a huge other conversation, but if you are interested in, in heart rate uh, exercise and different things like that, you can uh, message me later and we can kind of have a a conversation about it but that's a great way to test also 
obviously difficult in a group setting, so I probably wouldn't use that necessarily as a testing marker, but all of the other things we talked about beforehand would be key to identifying some symptoms. So now um, let's go into talking about pain and when a skater identifies pain or how do you identify pain in skating. So let's first talk about, we have three different types that I'm gonna go through today just for purpose of time. And the first one is going to be muscle pain. Then we're gonna talk about tendon pain. And then we're gonna talk about bone pain. And knowing how to identify those three with your skaters will be a really good, uh, important way of showing, you know, I, I understand this is starting to look like this, or we need to slow down because your tendon is starting to look like it's going into tendonitis, or that bone pain you're feeling in your shin might be starting to look like a stress fracture with shin splints. So let's talk a little bit about that, and then we can, uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll pause for a second just because, oh, Mary Liz, yeah? Is there, oh, in the group chat, you are telling me, okay. Um, so we, oh, tips, guidance on identifying difference between growth spurt pain and overuse technique injury pain. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good, great question. And then the next one from Anya was, um, would you recommend a basketball sneaker high top for off ice jumps? So maybe we can answer those ones uh, quickly and then go into the definition. So um, maybe from Anya, because that was part of our last conversation. So uh, basketball sneaker high tops, uh, definitely no, <laughs> um, only because I know, I think Anya, I know what you're going at with that is probably just, are you thinking because it's more like, uh, like a skate where it's like a little bit higher up? Maybe you can answer that question if you're, if that's your thought process there. Uh, okay. Yes. So yeah, I, I understand that's exactly what I would have thought you were thinking of. Um, I think the, the difference is that, um, the basketball sneakers are, kind of, they're, they're okay, but the thing is when we look at jumping, um, for basketball, when the, the athlete is jumping up into the air, it's really a kind of movement going just straight up and then down without any kind of rotation. Um, I mean, they might rotate a little bit if they're turning, but uh, the thing is with skating jumps, we need to make sure that they have the proper cushioning coming down if they're doing more acceleration, especially triples. Um, when it comes to doubles on the floor, it's, it's just, in my opinion, too flat. So it, it can work, but it might be a little bit too flat. Um, sometimes what the best shoes, in, in my opinion and my experience, are not the Nikes and the beautiful looking shoes, um, but the ones that are more for uh, arch support so that the, when the skater's landing, they're not dropping in with that um, arch collapsing. So for example, uh, New Balance is a good one. I personally wear Brooks, uh, Brooks shoes. They're really, really well made with the, the heel support. Um, Saucony, those are good shoes. There's probably a bunch of other ones that I'm just missing, but um, definitely try to avoid like really, really flat surface kind of shoes. Um, especially if you're jumping in uh, the on concrete or those kind of surfaces. If you're jumping on um, the hardwood floor, I notice with the flat surface kind of shoes, they don't stick as much and the skaters actually end up sliding more and it's very slippery and I get a bit nervous watching those jumps. So that, that might be a, a good reason enough to just have more support on the, on the um, under part of the sole. So uh, does that help a little bit, Anya, with the, the sneakers? And then Mary Liz, tips and guidance on identifying uh, difference between growth spurt pain and overuse technique injury pain. So yeah, growth spurt pain, like Osgood slaughters and all of those kind of things, um, those are very typical in, in younger skaters. And usually it's a pain that doesn't get worse, right? So sometimes, you have the pain and then you feel it, but then the next day you kind of wake up and you're like, oh, okay, I can deal with it again. And then you go through the day and it starts to get a little bit worse, but then the next day it recovers and you ice it and it feels a bit better. Whereas like an overuse technique injury would be something that gets progressively worse over time. So in, in something like 
if they're constantly doing, you know, jump squat um, technique, technique improperly, that can cause an overdevelopment of the quads and we have an imbalance in the back of the leg. And so that can also pull on the tendon in the front of the knee and that eventually maybe can get into patellar tendinitis, right? So uh, that might be an overuse injury versus like an Oshkid slaughters. And especially with that kind of stuff, um, if you're trying to identify the difference, usually the best way is you go to your, you know, doctor or physio and you ask, you know, what kind of pain is this? And, and they can usually identify if it's a growth spurt pain or if it's an injury related pain. But when it comes to your own training expertise and working with skaters initially, um, any pain in the joint area is usually a sign of, you know, maybe something is not right. So we want to identify it early enough. So if a skater comes to you and says, I have pain in my knee, first of all, where is that pain coming from? So they point to the middle, the side, or, or from the back, and then you can kind of see, okay, if they point directly underneath the kneecap, and you might need to just do some research on your own to identify some of these. Like if you type in, even if on Google, you go and type in common uh, knee, knee pain or symptoms, um, you can kind of see, and not to be doctors by any means, that's not what we're here to do. I think if they, if they have an injury, you should send them to a physio or a doctor right away um, because that's not your exact you know, expertise necessarily. But if you have a general idea of what it could be um, and it's over you know, a week or two and you're just kind of working with them, maybe then that's a good time to identify, okay, has it gotten worse over two weeks? If it's gotten worse over two weeks, they need to go see a doctor. If it's better in two weeks and the pain is gone, then it's okay. It, it was probably just a little tweak and they recovered quickly and it's fine. So um, does that help a little bit? Do you have any other questions around that? Yeah, maybe once we get into like more details of the actual um, different types. So let's talk about muscle pain because I think that's the, the biggest one that a lot of coaches deal with in terms of injuries or pain or whatever. Um, so there's good muscle pain and then there's bad muscle pain. And we need to know the difference between good and bad. So when we talk about training, a lot of times coaches and you know, it's, it, it's common, very common between a lot of people. So it's, it's not just one or two people. It's the mindset of like, let's just push them until they feel like they're at their maximum and every day we'll pound them out so you know they're sweating and they're dying and their muscles are sore and the next day they come back and they're like I can't move and you're like good that was a good workout then right and then every day you do that to them and you feel like okay we're getting somewhere but let's take a step back and look at what is good muscle pain and what's muscle pain that maybe you should not worry about but just slow down a little bit and rethink how the training is going so good muscle pain, of course, when you do an exercise and you're using the muscles for the first time or, or you're doing a new exercise for the first time and you haven't quite developed in that area, there will be some stress on the muscle and the muscle will feel a little bit of pain. It's like that saying like, no pain, no gain. That's where this comes from. It's like, you know, you wanna feel a little bit of pain to feel improvement, right? Which is true in a way. You want to feel that the muscles are working but the difference is that you want to put gradual stress on those muscles and you want it not to over exhaust. So good pain is the one that you feel that burn at the end of the workout, but then two or three days later, you're, you're, you don't feel that burn anymore. And it's a, it's a good, you know, next step to whatever training you're doing. The bad kind of pain is the one that lasts for days upon days. So you might, feel a little bit sore, you know, not necessarily the first day, but then the next day and then the day after. And then you, you tell your coach, like, I can't even walk up the stairs. And those kind of painful days of muscle pain means that you over exhausted that muscle. It wasn't uh, ready for the kind of workout that you put it through. And now the energy stores can't be replenished properly. So you're getting into a chronic fatigue uh, state which is also like this kind of um, fatigue is called delayed uh, 
onset muscle soreness. So it's basically meaning like over a few days, you still feel that soreness and your body hasn't recovered properly. So in this situation, it's sometimes normal, even myself. Like if I go to the gym and I work out and I haven't worked out my biceps in a while and I'm pumped out, you know, repetitions with whatever amount of weight and I push myself through it, I know that two or three days later, my biceps will be pretty sore. So that kind of stuff happens on a regular basis where you as an athlete want to just push yourself because you know, like that's where your head is at and you, you can do it and go for it. But essentially, and I've made these mistakes myself too, is when you go to the gym, you need to control the training so that it's slowly over days and weeks that you build those muscles to get to the point where you need to. So that yes, you might do a workout and feel a little soreness at the moment and then the next day you recover, but you're not gonna feel soreness throughout two or three days. Because then what happens? After two or three days, you're still feeling the soreness, but your coach makes you do training the next day and you push through another pounded training day. Now you're just offsetting, muscle fibers are ripping a little bit more and more. There's inflammation in the muscle, there's stress in the muscle. Now the recovery is gonna take you maybe five days, but the next day you pound out again, you do off ice jumps and you keep pushing through. And then over the next four days, what's happened now is you've over exhausted that muscle and you're now getting into what's called overtraining. And then we have to be really, really careful because once you get into that overtraining state, it's difficult to recover quick enough to do the next exercise. And you might think, okay, well, if I just take one day off, I might be okay. And then just pound myself again until I feel better again the next day. But most likely the body has already had a deep enough muscle tear, stress on the, on the joints, and now you're putting yourself at risk for an injury to happen over those next few days. And it's not easy uh, to recover once you start getting into the overtraining phase. So that would be the muscle pain related. Does anyone have any questions regarding that before we move on to uh, tendon pain? If you do at the end, that's okay too. And we'll wait for them to come in. Okay, so let's move on to uh, a little bit more complex tendon pain. And this is sometimes more difficult to identify than muscle pain because a tendon is the attachment point between the muscle and the bone. So where that tendon attaches, it depends on if you're going to feel you know, pain or not in that area. So for example, a very common uh, tendon pain is in the uh, me, and then also a lot of tendonitis that I see from, you know, just even my own personal experience is tendonitis in the foot. So from overuse of um, the anterior tibialis muscles. So when it comes to tendon pain, this is basically, um, it gets irritated if it's stressed too rapidly. So when, it, when we look at tendonitis or anything like that, that starts to form into um, and tendonitis forms over time. So it's basically a repetitive kind of uh, stress on the tendon and then little micro tears in the tendon occur. There's a lot of inflammation and then that leads to tendonitis. So how does this uh, happen? A lot of uh, tendon, tendonitis in the kneecap tendon and the patellar tendon comes from jumping. So you'll hear, hear like jumper's knee. Um, that is a lot of jump squats or any figure skating jumps really if we want to look at it that way and so you're maybe asking yourself okay how do we prevent tendonitis in the knee because that's like what we do for our skaters all the time and so that's a a great question to ask because you will maybe save the skater if you can follow certain things so first thing is checking out if the skaters are tight in their muscles so if their glutes and their hamstrings are tight, uh, sometimes that puts a little bit of overloaded stress on the quad. And so the quad used, gets overused and the tendon that attaches from into the quad into the, um, into the uh, shin bone is basically being overstressed and now you're seeing that like micro tears. So sometimes it can be tightness of the muscle. So you wanna check that the skater is uh, not really, really tight 
uh, in the back of the leg for that specific example. There could be other examples. I'm just kind of giving that one uh, as one for today. Uh, so muscle imbalance is a big one. And a lot of skaters that I work with, and I'm sure you've seen, uh, have bigger uh, quad development versus uh, the posterior chain, which is the uh, hamstrings and the glutes. And if you test your, any of your skaters, the best way to do it is you can have them do a single leg squat. And most of the time, they will go down okay, and then they can't get back up. So it's a very easy test to do with sports specific exercise to see where that strength is coming from. You'll see sometimes the skater will actually be okay and they can lift themselves up by pushing forward into the knee and then come up. That is a big X. <laughs> Watch out for that. Make sure their heel is pressing into the ground and they're using their glute and hamstring to rise up, not coming from the knee and the quad. So you'll see that imbalance right away if they go down nicely and then they can't get back up. You can even test it on the ice if that's the case, if you don't have them on the floor. So muscle imbalance is huge and there's exercises that we need to develop uh, before uh, we get into doing really heavy jumping or jump squats and all that kind of stuff. So I just realized it's 5.45, so I need to move this faster, but Maybe we can go a little bit longer on my discussion and I can stay a little bit over if that's, if that's okay with people. Um, just because I really want to go through everything on this today. So um, then uh, we look at different things like technique. So are you teaching the technique properly for the skaters? So it's whether or not they're, you know, if we take, for example, the squat, are they doing the squat too far forward into their knees? Are they lifting their heels up? Do they tuck their pelvis under when they're doing the squat? All of these things uh, can lead to improper technical uh, movements. And then from there, that can lead to tendon pain, muscle pain, all of these kind of things. So we need to be really careful on the technique. So on your online training sessions, if you're in a group, make sure you're constantly demonstrating the exercise for the skaters. Visual cues are huge for skaters. Same thing on the ice. When you're demonstrating, it needs to be like exactly the way you want them to jump it or do it. Because if you demonstrate some way, they look at you and they watch you and they see, okay, if, if they do it like that, I'm gonna try to copy like that. And, and that's the same in off ice. If you show it incorrectly, they will do it incorrectly. Um, too many repetitions, too soon. Those are all tendon pain related. So if they're doing 25 jump squats and then three sets of that, and then let's do another 40 lunge jumps in the same session, and then let's do off ice jumps in the same session, and now we've really got them. But <laughs> it's like, well, let's take a step back and see what that next day is going to look like. And then are you going to do jump squats and lunge jumps and stuff on the next day too? maybe not the best idea because they need that recovery time. So we'll talk about how to plan in a second. Um, anyone who has questions on tendon pain, we can, we can discuss later. Let's just go quickly through bone pain. Bone pain is a little bit more uh, of a challenging conversation because it's harder to identify directly bone pain. The easiest one for me to identify is uh, probably in the shin because it's the closest. But um, so the same thing with muscles, and tendons, the bones are also really responsive to stress. So if you pound the body and the bone can't take the stress load at that time in, in the intensity, it slowly breaks down over time. So the way you build up bone density strength is you create this scientific term osteoblasts. And osteoblasts are what form around the bone to make it stronger. And so that's what thickens the bone so that when you do more impact pounding, it's more protective. And then you have your tendons and your muscles and all the other stuff surrounding it. But the deeper layer, the bone is just like everything else, it's going to get impacted with stress. So you'll see a lot of um, skaters if they go into too many uh, runs for the day. So if you make them run, all the time and they haven't run in a long time it's a lot of repetitive stress and so the bone if you look at the shin bone for example will start to feel the micro tears in the bone and eventually 
you know, I hate to say, it, but it can actually stress fracture or it can just break in half if it, that's the worst case possible. Um, that's usually not always the case, but it can happen, right? There's always a, an exception. So um, making sure that you're doing an exercise in a organized way that you're putting together your programming for your skaters so there's not a lot of stress on the bone initially if they haven't built up their training to that point. So hopefully that makes sense with the bone. I, it, it's, it's really a harder way to identify an injury, but one way that I would say if you're looking at a skater and they're telling you that their shin hurts when they're jumping a lot, that's a clear indication that that bone is being overstressed. And I can speak for myself. I had shin splints many, many times. And I learned all of the key things to do before to strengthen the bone around the shin so that you never get shin splints again. And now I can run, I can jump, I can do all these things. And it involves all the things we talked about. Like, are you stretching enough? Are you stretching your calves? Are you stretching the front of your shin? All of those things. Are you strengthening the calves? Are you strengthening your glutes? Are you strengthening? So the body runs from head to toe and it has to be strong all over the place. You can't just do an isolation on the glute strengthening and think everything else is going to fall into place okay. So now that we've covered pain and hopefully you can identify some of these things a little bit more, uh, let's talk about how to program to prevent overtraining. And this will be our final kind of conversation. So for coaches, it's very difficult sometimes because I think we can talk about overtraining and it's really easy to say like, okay, this is how you identify and, and okay, one day my skater has pain, but now, oh, oops, it's too late. So now we need to figure out a way to program ahead of time so that you don't run into these issues or you run into them very little because sometimes there are cases where you can't help it and somebody just has you know that kind of body type and that it weakens quicker and that's that's it but um but let's let's start small so when we look at programming and periodization it's overwhelming i, I mean i did my level three course so i know that what it takes to put together a periodized plan it's not always easy you have to go through so many different steps and then it's like all oh, this whirlwind and you know like who has time to do that in the moment when you're trying to put together your program for the skaters in, the, in these times right so let's think about how do you how do you start small think about the month take the month for example you have your one month and you organize it into what do i want them to accomplish in this one month so what do you want let's take an example say it's i want them to be more conditioned Okay, so that's very vague because what does conditioning mean? It means strength, speed, endurance, agility, all of these things that prepare the body for sport. So what part of conditioning do you want to get them better? Do you want them to improve their speed for this month? Or do you want a combination? Do you want power and strength? Um, so if you're looking at power and strength, I drew this little chart. It's really funny because I just like did it on a piece of paper. But here's my little my pyramid, okay? And what, what it is, is basically leading you up to in-season performance. I don't know if you can see that, but it's like, I will read it to you. At the bottom of the chart, you have muscle activation, stability, and endurance. So if you're stuck and you feel like, I have no idea, I'm not a fitness expert, probably the best thing would be like consult with a fitness expert. But if you are kind of like, okay, I just wanna get them going or whatever, start with muscle activation stability and endurance and what this means is the little muscle groups that stabilize so we're working through uh, balance exercises and as much as sometimes you're thinking well i need to push them through a workout because they need to sweat and it's like well they will sweat if they do the workout properly even balance, if I'm training my own balance exercise, I'm sweating by the end because the, the amount of force and strength it takes you to hold those positions is really incredible. Like if you do it properly, you should be shaking sometimes holding because you're wobbling, your foot's activating, you know? So strengthening all the little muscle groups around all the joints, making sure you have endurance of the core, endurance of the glutes, endurance, all of these kind of things. And there's tons and tons of exercises on this. Then we move up the ladder or up the pyramid to strength. So strength training is the next step. So always strength before power. 
When you think about uh, power, it comes from being strong in the muscles so that you can lift up. You can't be explosive if there's no strength. So we need to start with strength. Maybe squats generally are okay, but even simple things like uh, glute raises, you know, hip, hip extensions, just lying down on your back, lifting up the glutes up and down, single leg, whatever you wanna do. But making sure that you're targeting every single muscle group that they need to be strong on the ice. So it's not just always about squats and lunges. Um, those are great for major muscle group development, and we should do those. There's no question about that. Everybody should be learning squats and lunges, but we should also be doing stabilizer exercises and making sure that they coincide with the strength that we're trying to get them to have on the ice. Um, then we get into power. So this would be our plyometric drills, our jump squats, or any kind of you know acceleration fast up into the air. Uh, so those are the plyo drills, maybe even off ice jumps eventually, right? So you might not start necessarily with off ice jumps, you might start with developing their strength. And then we get into metabolic conditioning. So that's where you can combine all of the strength and power and stability and put it into a program where they're doing a structured circuit of high intensity workouts. So 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off, this workout, that, that uh, exercise, and then putting it in a circuit. That's metabolic conditioning. So high intensity reps uh, for small duration of time and then with little breaks. So that will prepare you for your in-season performance. Now, the, the question is, okay, how do I know how to put all that together? Because it is a little bit difficult when you think about all of those components. I have this much time, you know, zero, to get them there. And we just need to race through everything. So this is where you can put together a plan so you can organize your thoughts and be more okay with the fact that Maybe today they won't be doing jumps all the time. Maybe they do 20 minutes of jumps three times a week for the beginning, and then they can lead up to more over the next coming weeks. Or, you know, this week we're going to focus on balance and stability, and on day one, day three, day four, we're going to do these exercises and then switch it up on day two and uh, three and do these exercises and teach the skaters the importance of these exercises. A lot of times skaters trust what you say, right? So it's like they think you know exactly what is going on. So it, we need to make sure that when you tell them, that's what they're trusting that the situation is going to be. So if you say, okay, this week the focus is this, we're gonna get better at this. And then next week we're gonna work on endurance. And then the next week we work on strength. And then we're gonna put it all together and see if we're all ready to do power. That's three weeks, enough time takes about 21 days to adjust to a new workout, and now you're ready to start your power. Three weeks is nothing in the grand scheme of the year, right? So take those three weeks and really spend it on developing the first parts of the pyramid, and then you can jump into power and most likely they're ready to go. So I think that we'll finish with that. Hopefully that helped a lot with uh, some of the key components to injury prevention. And um, yes, Mary Liz just asking, is metabolic training similar to Tabata? Yes, it is. It's a, it's a very similar thing. Uh, Tabata is just like a, um, I actually use that app a lot for my, my workouts too. Um, it's basically, you can set timers to uh, the workouts. So it's like 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, uh, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, or whatever you want to set it to. Um, basically, metabolic training is exactly like that high intensity training, intervals for short duration, high um, and low rest periods. So um, hopefully that helps. Any questions does anyone have? We'll take some questions for a few minutes and then we will call it night. That was great. Thank you so much for uh, listening. And hopefully you learned a few little tips. And even if you learned one thing, it's always great um, with these kind of webinars to hear different things from different perspectives. And, you know, we try our best to be uh, perfect and no one is perfect. I'm not perfect either. And we just need to, you know, take a step back sometimes and assess, you know, maybe we did something not so great with our training and maybe we learned something and now 
let's take a step back and say, okay, well, we can fix these things and we can start from scratch today because tomorrow's a new day and, you know, get the skaters to work on some stability tomorrow, for example, if that's what you're thinking of. So anything that you, uh, you think and you learn from, you can start to use it on a daily basis and there's no uh, wrong thing in training. It's like you're always learning. So let me see any, oh, we got some thank yous. That's great. <laughs> Mary Liz, your brain got a good workout. Yeah, sorry about that. Sometimes I talk so much and I can't stop talking about certain things and, and I don't stop. So I need to learn to take a breather too. Okay, amazing. So if no one has any questions, I will leave it at that. This video is going to be uh, is recorded. So we're going to uh, put it up if you want to send it to your friends or anyone who wasn't able to listen today. Um, and if you also have any questions, you can leave a, a note on the Facebook page in the comment section because it'll stay up there and then I'll get your, uh, your answers to you. Um, can you see this or here's the, do you have a picture of the pyramid? I actually just drew this picture myself. So if you want, I can snap it and send it to you. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, everybody. Let's uh, have a great evening and we will hopefully see you all soon and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, my email is info at flexifit.com. So if you have anything you think of tonight or tomorrow, or if you're stuck at any point, uh, happy to help you out and get you on track for your periodization or your training or whatever it might be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.